welcome into another episode of Everything is Logistics, a podcast for the thinkers in freight. I'm your host, Blythe Brimleave, and we are proudly presented by SPI Logistics. And in this episode, I want to resurface a couple of conversations around e-commerce and how one of those companies, Shein, dominates the discussion. Because 30% of all e-commerce shipments coming into the West Coast of the United States belongs to Timu or Shein. 30%. And as long as those shipments are valued at under $800, it ships into this country tax-free. So in this first segment I have prepared for y'all, we're going to be bringing up my good friend Grace Sharkey to talk about the influx of these shipments, how our customs and border departments are trying to keep up with it, and then later on we're going to get into the retail and influencer side of Shein's business practices. All of the talks that I went to were fantastic. One of yours in particular was the one on like AI and like customs yeah. and border trade. And I, I've said on this, on the series, you know, lots of times I am such an obsessed fan of To Catch a Smuggler. That's a show yes. that comes on National Geographic. So I'm obsessed with like customs and border policies and like, you know, I, I, just the flow of goods through country to country. And you had um, a woman on your panel, Janet, I'm, I'm blanking on her last name, but I, uh, she was like 70 years old yeah. talking about like adopting AI, talking about trade compliance. She stole the show. Like she yeah. was so brilliant during that talk. Do, do you have a little bit, I guess, maybe background or insight on her? Yeah, so she, uh, Janet Labuda, and for everyone out there, actually, I my latest article on Freight Waves is about this panel. So you can get some of the stories off of uh, that from that Blythe's talking about. Uh, she it works as a consultant for customs uh, policy for Maersk. And she had spent most of her career, I think 25 years of it, working for uh, the customs border protection. So uh, she the best way to explain it is like you know i think some people hear customs border cbp and they just think oh the people like checking our checking us out when we cross the border uh, she made it like i i think they should do they deserve a tv show i mean she like made it very like ncis -y, where it was like wow like you've seen some things in your life you know and one of my favorite stories and i talked about this in articles she, she talks about I don't know, you might have came in right after uh, Operation Mirage, where they took, so this was when she was working textiles uh, for CBP, and they took like 150 of the top ex, uh, textile importers, and they wanted to prove that they were who they said they were, like see how... Um, uh how legit some of these importers were so they they went to china they went and visited all of the physical addresses on the paperwork for these imports and only 55 percent of those 150 i believe importers were legit the other half were like just like a woman in a house and then they're like well, how does this work like how are you doing all this paperwork and she's like i I don't do any of it. I provide them my address. I get a penny per transaction. And sh this woman had made like $10,000 a month what? from like allowing the Chinese government to like use her location or, or the Chinese importer to use the location for fraud. So it's uh, that is like, and that's just a, like choosing 150. Like imagine all of the importers that they see on a daily, a daily basis. Right. And here's the problem. And uh, she brought, I actually brought it up because I knew exactly, I, I knew she knew what I was talking about, but uh, a couple of years ago, right. I, th I think 2018 e-commerce started to be a big deal. And the CBP was like, we need to address this. So they, you can Google it. I actually have a link to it in the article. Uh, they came up with a plan to start figuring out how to get their control of, of all these imports and, and all these e-commerce, I mean, all these small packages, right? Like we can't open up every single one that there's no way, there's no way to prove that a lot of this is right. So there's a number of tech companies, Altana Technologies is one, um, uh, Boxy is another one that I've talked to in the past that works with uh, Customs Border and the Department of uh, Defense as well to 
help them figure out, okay, if this is the limited number of resources we have to watch for fraud, watch for drugs, watch for um, uh, even like, like counterfeit let's, goods. Yeah, and... counterfeit goods, right? Then here's this is who you should target or these boxes is, is what you should be looking at and and helps them at least pinpoint where to start and it's just kind of funny to like you, you don't really think about it but all of the packages that are coming in right like they don't check every single one of them so they don't even check they don't even have time to check all the trucks that come through the border so it's um, there's one uh t i talked about in the article but like there's one time they caught like five pounds like uh, over five pounds of fentanyl and i know that doesn't sound like a lot but a drop of fentanyl will like kill you it's two milligrams i think is lethal dose so wow. that comes out to potentially i mean killing close to a half a million people wow. so um yeah it's uh it's pretty interesting and i like it, like i said she really like she's fascinating she started writing a book like on the plane to the event like she was reading us like her first like paragraph and uh so i can't wait for this book to come out because i think it's gonna be full of stories that's for sure <laughs> and, and i think she too she had a mind-blowing stat of like something like 30 percent of e-commerce shipments that are coming from china to the west coast are all from the the company timu yes so yes. Uh, it, timu like the uh, the gamified like shopping e-commerce app um it's kind of adjacent to uh Shein, kind of not really uh maybe uh, a lot of the same technology Shein, but everything like yeah. and everything <laughs> it's, like Groupon. it's like Groupon right where it's like what's not on this site like right <laughs> and it's one of those it, it's one of those experiences that I've never felt like I was duped like online shopping yeah but Timu duped me <laughs> yeah like I, I I did the thing I I they had you know that Super Bowl commercial and I was like oh you know let me let me try it out let me download the app and I downloaded the app and I started up a cart of just some, you know, obviously some knockoff things um, that looked interesting, like the Dyson uh, hair dryer that has like the five uh, yeah. tools in one. Like I got that thing. Um, I got, you know, a bunch of other things and it's crap. It's crap products. You really have to like look for um, the good products and really just be willing to roll the dice on it. But yeah. anyways, I, I started up a, a, a cart of the things that I wanted and then, you know, you, you do what you do. You leave the app and you you don't buy anything yet. Uh, so I, I went to social media and I was browsing on there and I got an ad on Instagram for a few products that looked interesting from Timu. And so I click on the ad. It opens up the app. What happened is that it opened up a separate cart from the one I already had. So oh. I thought that I was adding things to my current cart. And when I saw the total price, I was like, oh, my gosh, like, that includes everything. That includes everything that I had just already added and the new stuff that was targeted to me in a social media post. And I clicked order, purchase, and then I go back and find out that they don't know. They just created a separate cart for me altogether. So I thought that that was a little bit shady. And I yeah. didn't like that because it, it was no. definitely like misleading. Um, have you bought anything from them? I, I've been on the app and I've, but that's kind of like my thing is like, I'm like, God, I know this is just going to be like destroyed once I get this. Um, so no, unfortunately I haven't followed through with a purchase for it yet, but I've gotten awfully close. And I, I, I will say I love watching uh, Timu unboxings. Like that's when they do those on uh, Instagram as well, but uh, it's, <laughs> No, don't buy not, the Dyson dupe. It yes. is not good. No, it's not good. It's yeah. already getting returned. Um, and you know how much of a hassle some of these companies are with with their returns. Anyways, um, so that was a really good yes. um stat from from Janet, and her talk was incredible. I hope you have her on the show soon. Um, yes. she was just it, it filled with like a wealth of knowledge. And what was so refreshing is that she's like, I'm a 70 year old woman, and I think that AI is like the next big thing. Like she's already using it and her processes. And I was like, oh. Thank God, you know, we, we don't have some kind of, you know, doomer speech on on AI and, it, you know, helping her do her job more efficiently. And the other two women on the panel were fantastic, too. Uh, but Janet just sort of stood out to me as, as, you know, panel wise from all the panels that I saw. She was the most entertaining. So so kudos to you. Are you in freight sales with a book of business looking for a new home? Or perhaps you're a freight agent in need of a better partnership. These are the kinds of conversations we're exploring in our podcast interview series called The Freight Agent Trenches, sponsored by SPI Logistics. 
Now I can tell you all day that SPI is one of the most successful logistics firms in North America who helps their agents with back office operations such as admin, finance, IT, and sales, but I would much rather you hear it directly from SPI's freight agents themselves. And what better way to do that than by listening to the experienced freight agents tell their stories behind the how and the why they joined SPI. Hit the freight agent link in our show notes to listen to these conversations, or if you're ready to make the jump, visit spi3pl.com. Now that you have a general idea of the massive amount of shipments coming into the U.S. from these two companies, let's talk a little bit more about Shein. Last year, they and a bunch of influencers got in some hot water when the company tried to PR their way into good supply chain messaging. The internet doing what the internet does best was not going to let them or the influencers off the hook. So Grace and I are going to be talking about this story, plus the moral dilemma of trying to shop in a world where everything is trying to kill you. First topic, though, fast fashion in the supply chain, because there are a lot of Shein influencers right now that are in a lot of shit and sort of, uh, I guess, you know, it's a, the, the too long didn't read, the too long didn't watch. This is making big waves and sort of like the, the fashion beauty landscape because a bunch of influencers were invited to visit a factory in, um, I, I, I think it was in Denver um, or around the Colorado area, or they were flown to China. One of the two, I couldn't really um, grasp where they actually did the factory tour. I would be surprised if they did a factory tour in the United States because I didn't know that she had any factories in the United States. Um, yeah. So they anyways, they took this trip. It was um, Shein. a little bit of backstory has um, they have some rumblings about their supply chain uh, morals. Uh, they use um, <laughs> low cost labor to, to put it uh, mildly. Um, they have factories staged all over the world where they can take advantage of low cost labor. And uh, that is the reason why you can get uh, very, very cheaply made clothes very pretty fast and uh, very cheap. We're talking like anywhere from like eight to ten dollars for a shirt that you'll see on a lot of different e-com shops, Amazon shops that will those shops will list it for around 30 bucks. Um, so it just kind of, you know, I guess it shines a light on their supplier system and where they're getting a lot of these clothing. So the influencers went there. They looked at a lot. Lot of their different operations within a warehouse um, and <clears throat> because of that uh, a lot of folks have come out and started commenting and targeting these influencers because they didn't know about or maybe they didn't know about you know some of their shady manufacturing policies um, they just got a tour of a warehouse and got some behind the scenes footage and now they're they're being blamed for um, Shein's I guess, supply chain. So um, with all that said, uh, Grace, I know you've done, you know, plenty of work on these types of stories. So so what is your early read on on this one? Uh, I will say they they did. I know they did fly them to China. So they did go to Ooh, China. Okay, on this okay. Trip. I and I will say I have like, uh, I have mixed feelings because I've attempted this this same flight myself. Uh, there's a, a big company out in china called jd.com hmm. and i've tried they they're like the amazon of china they've got like all robotics like uh, warehouses and stuff like that and i've tried so hard to get close to their marketing team and i'm like and they're they did kind of the same thing uh years ago and so i was like if you're ever doing this again like on the list <laughs> just because I, I think i've never been to china i think i would love it and yeah. uh uh Hopefully, I would be blind to whatever atrocities that are happening behind the scenes. Uh, also, I will say I, I I bought from the the site once or twice, and I've never been fully thrilled by the quality. So mm -hmm. at first, I was like, okay, interested in seeing like maybe how I've done deep dives on their uh, technology. Though they have a, a ton. Of investment that they've done uh, in the past, uh, in particular, that uh, is is pretty interesting. Uh, and a Are lot of algorithms it, really sophisticated. Yes, yeah. I mean, they they're uh, deep into buy now pay later systems. Their mm. reverse logistics uh, is is pretty huge. They work with a company called Narvar that has over two hundred thousand uh, drop off locations. Uh, they have uh, they 
put a lot of money into the influencer side of things, right? Mm. Um, gaining that loyalty and retention, really gamifying rewards for customers uh, and, for, and for those influencers. Um, they, I know of big areas, uh, traceability, visibility tools. I think that's a lot of people will say, right, if I do buy from them, uh, it usually gets to me pretty quickly and it usually is, they're pretty open to the delivery times and things of that nature. Uh, so it is, it's pretty interesting as a whole, I think where they're investing in making sure that they're competing really well with more of these, uh, U S, uh, operations. Now, uh, how are they getting things done so fast and so cheap? Uh, probably not great labor practices, which is why everyone is really fighting against them. Uh, and when I say everyone, I mean, our elected representatives. So, I guess uh, she and girls, if you're out there and you're or guys and you want to fight against it, reach out to your uh, rep your your representatives and let them know to stop it. But uh, yeah, because they're, no, they're trying to block the IP. I, I, she and is trying to IPO in the United States, but they're blocking it, I think. Yeah, well, I think they put it on pause just because of the uproar from representatives, um, knowing that the fight's there, right? Whatever you want to go public you want to make it as smooth as possible aka pay less lawyers as much as possible so uh, i think that's part of the reason they're holding off for now but uh, uh yeah a lot of representatives aren't happy that and it makes sense i mean they are a, a powerful being they're uh, anti-competitive and the fact that you're using labor that no one else here is allowed to use so um yeah i, I guess i i wasn't surprised though that they brought in influencers it's a it's a pretty smart attempt to try to cover yourselves up. But I think what um, happened, right, is that backlash on the influencer themselves, knowing whether or not you saw any of it, knowing, okay, well, how's how, no one there asked the tough question of, but you're also in China. Who's trying to ask tough questions? That's it's like who's who gets this trip to China? It's like okay, now that we're here and you know, right. I'm everyone wants to pretend as if they're an investigative journalist, and yeah. it's it, it, no, it, it is nobody does it more than like the keyboard warriors who see. And I think that there's kind of like a few things going on. I think that there's a little bit of jealousy going on from the commenters seeing yeah. somebody get advantage get. Um, get get the advantages of you know getting flown out um yep. going on these you know behind the scenes type tours um and and you know not having access to those sort of same opportunities and then also you know there's you know the geopolitical like struggles between the us and and china is that's another kind of play involved as well and then there's you know the the folks who are really passionate about the environment so it's like all of these things that are coming together and obviously labor laws as well and you know ethical sourcing which is just uh, it's kind of like exhausting at times so i don't blame like these and because from like a greater point i there's a lot of responsibility that's put on the consumer to know these yeah. things to yep. know the entire supply chain of these big conglomerates when sometimes you just need a dress in a few days. You just need something cheap in a few Literally, days. Yes. So are you, yeah. you know, some days I'm not going to have my, you know, morality standards, you know, eyes wide open on every single thing that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I just think that they're, they got a little, I think the overwhelming majority of these influencers got too much heat when yeah. that heat should be directed towards the company. Because mm -hmm. it's something like a hot, like close to oh, or seventy one companies are like uh, the top one hundred companies are responsible for seventy one percent of emissions since like the nineteen eighties. Yeah, and it's these big corporations. It's in their best interest to put the onus on the consumer. And so if they make it challenging to find out the, I guess, the morality and the ethical nature of the supply chain, if they put that on the consumer, then they can kind of wash their hands of it. And that's what's happening right now with these influencers because Shein is not coming in to help and defend them. It's yeah. everyone, they're, they're getting blocked, like they're or not getting blocked, but um, a lot of these influencers have turned their comments off. They've, they've deleted the posts. Um, there's one girl in particular, which I should probably play the clip now. Um, she seems to be the one that is getting a lot of the, uh, I guess, uh, ire of folks is being directed towards her, but she 
apparently, I haven't seen the videos. Um, some of them were taken down. She deleted them because she was trying to like double down on her message of like, I met with them behind closed doors in Denver. And I think that's where Denver comes from. Um, so she met with Sheehan people in Denver to kind of talk about some of those ethical issues. And she said that she was comfortable with their answers. And so she created a bunch of comment or content defending um, Sheehan. And so I think that um, that's why that she's getting a little bit of this heat. Yeah. And so um, let me well, see you, if I you know, what's interesting, too, is like, you're exactly right. Like, as much as our generation wants to say, like, hey, we stand for right these like ESG initiatives and sustainable practices. They're valued at over a hundred billion dollars. I think it's the average person has bought fourteen items every year from them. Oh wow! Uh, and twenty eight percent of U.S. fashion sales is going to them as well. So wow, yes. that is huge. So at, at some point, it's like. I say this to people too on anything political, like, you know, what doesn't change things yelling at people on social media, like take that same energy, write a letter to your representative, go visit them. Right. As you are going to fly to China, go, go visit your representative down the street. Who's in an office that's completely approachable and, and let them know, like, that's how you feel. But like, yeah, bullying a bunch of influencers on TikTok. Which, if we want to go down that <laughs> rabbit hole, owned by the Chinese. They're being bullied on Instagram, too. <laughs> China's like, win, win, win. <laughs> ching, ching, ching. Like, yeah, ching, ching, ching. <laughs> which is, God, that's not, probably not the right phrase to use this, but I mean, yeah. like, money-wise. <laughs> Quite literally, they're like, oh, yes. Oh, yes, go, go make content on TikTok and yell at each other there. That's not good for us either. And tweet it from your iPhones and yeah. text it from your iPhones that are also, you know, it, it, I mean, how how deep are we going to go with this like ethical supply chain? Because um, right? I would I would be willing to bet that the overwhelming majority of those I would willing to bet all of them that all of those comments that were made in a negative fashion were coming from a phone that has natural resources that were sourced using a lot of the same corrupt labor practices. Um, yep. So that's I guess that's not an excuse. But it is something that, you know, from like a fast fashion standpoint, it is becoming, I think, more just aware uh, with our generation, but also with younger generations. I think that's why we're seeing, you know, a lot of the increases in like vintage fashion and vintage finds. And I, I don't, you know, anecdotally here in Jacksonville, there are a handful of shops that have popped up all over um, Jacksonville, specializing in like you know, vintage sports gear um, from like Florida based teams or just really anywhere, you know, people are getting rid of their old stuff and they're going to thrift stores and they're finding them and they're sourcing them themselves and then selling it in their retail shops. So it's shops specifically designed to, to, is it rethread or not rethread, but yeah, I guess up, up skill, up, up sale. I don't know what that, that phrase is called, but it's, it's basically just making sure that your the clothes that you're buying um, has a certain shelf life where you can reuse them multiple times multiple um, you know decades versus like the Shein clothes which you know may fall apart after a couple of days there was one shirt I bought from Shein and this is totally my fault but I tried to put an iron on it and it melted right to the iron um, so it wasn't, yeah. it, it's not the best made stuff either but, no. but let me play this clip really quick because this is the, the chick I was talking about um, that is uh, she's facing the most because she's doubled down she has since gone and deleted a lot of those posts um, but this is her sort of explaining. Brokering success demands a battle-ready strategy. Thai TMS equips freight brokers with the ultimate battle station for conquering a tough market. With Thai, brokers gain access to a comprehensive platform where rate intelligence and quote history converge on a single screen. It's not just a page, it's a strategic command center designed to help brokers win. Thai equips your team with all of the data they need to negotiate with confidence and allows them to communicate directly with carriers and customers from a simple control base. Revolutionize the way your brokers perform by giving them a competitive advantage with Thai TMS. For more info, go to tai-software.com backslash battle stations. And we also have a link for you in the show notes to sign up for a demo. Feel like a show it didn't feel like something was quickly put together influencer danny carbonari is speaking out against growing criticism 
after posting glowing reviews of Xi'an's operations in China. In an almost 12-minute video, the influencer begins by saying she is imperfect and can take accountability for her actions. She describes being interested in the brand over their size, inclusivity, and affordability, and said she's friends with someone who worked there who helped make further introductions. She explains the company took her on a brand trip to Tahoe where she says she brought up many concerns and questions to the higher ups. Later, she said she had an off-the-record meeting with political people and journalists where higher ups addressed more questions and gave answers. To me, I was, I'm a very like logistic person and um, they just gave so many numbers and like that's when I learned about like their auditing system and how they do have so many suppliers. She explains that the China trip was organized because the company <laughs> wanted to put an end to criticism. We're aware of all these rumors and all of this stuff that's going on and we want to put an end to it. The trip, we were not paid for the trip, we were not paid to post, um, our travel accommodations were taken care of. But ultimately, Danny still says she needs to do better, adding that the experience has caused her to reevaluate her brand and herself. I should have done more research, and I think content creators in general, we don't do enough research, and I think especially plus-size content creators, we're just so happy to be included. I'm, you know, sorry and sad that a lot of people that don't know me, um, you know, are so, so angry and upset, but the best thing that I can do moving forward is to lead with the same intention and authenticity I always have and add in doing the research, um, doing my part. So, thoughts. <laughs> I'm like a logistics person, okay? <laughs> I know, but... That's why I wanted to play that clip, because <laughs> she said that line. <laughs> I was like, we have to play this because she's trying to bring the, um, the logistics girlies into her drama and we're not going to stand all, for it. Logistics girlies, I want you. <laughs> I love that. Like, what audience is she talking to? Our audience? How dare she? Uh, she's starting to creep in. They they found out. <laughs> I also love that they actually like forced her into labor too. How Chinese of them. Uh, <laughs> it's so awesome. Like she's at one point literally packing boxes like this is perfect um uh you know it's interesting because like they could have i knowing uh, not knowing china like china and our best friends but knowing china's antics like there's always other like that could have been like a warehouse i wouldn't be surprised if that's like a upfront warehouse that they take clients to oh and, for sure you know what i mean I, I doubt that's where it's all happening i mean for the amount of clothing and stuff in that like no, there's no way that's where that's all happening um i just hate i will say i hate apology videos just like do it and move on like i it's, I, I don't know why people spend this time like Oh my god! I made a mistake. Like, no, you got a free trip to China. Like, great for yes, you. Yes, like <laughs> double down on that. Yeah, like, who so would? I mean, I, I <laughs> we've seen you know some of these logistical operations up close at like the Manifest Conference, for example, where you can see these robotics and like these intricate yes. systems that truly is fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I can totally empathize oh. with is getting an opportunity like that, being able to getting a flight, getting travel accommodations to go to another. It, most people would not turn that opportunity down. Yeah. Um, I, I would have had a lot more respect for her if she just doubled down on it. And yeah. she said, hey, you know, th this is what I'm doing and this is why I'm doing it. And 90% of y'all would do the exact same things. 90% yeah. of y'all would take this trip. Um, but now she has since, um, she has deleted all those videos promoting um, the, I guess, behind the scenes, not tours that she's done, but behind the scenes conversations because she called herself an investigative journalist. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Ma'am, you take outfit photos. <laughs> you are not oh an investigative God. journalist. <laughs> It's a completely different oh skill my. set. She's, she's, a, she's a logistics person and an investigative <laughs> journalist. It's like, we do not accept you. Yeah, exactly. I know those people. Say no. They don't have time for whatever you're doing right now. Oh, my God. That's so funny. You know, it's it's tough because I am excited when you talk about visibility tech in this space. I think it'll be much easier as we move forward to get more insight into, like, our supply chains and be able to say, hey, this is who I'm buying from. This is where the product's from. It's just, you know, hmm. 
I want maybe I'll just let's play men for this one because at the end of the day, <laughs> we just need dresses sometimes for events to look good really fast. And if society hadn't put that pressure on women for hundreds <laughs> of years, maybe she and wouldn't be what it is today. So <laughs> I, I need to actually link in um, the show my, notes. That's my conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> I I embarrassingly like know um very little about like the fast fashion supply chain. Uh I I should know more, but I think a part of me for a long time did not want to know because yes. it's almost like, you know, where you know, when you start asking questions of like where did the eggs come from? Where does meat come from? And then you start yeah. diving into a lot of those different questions. I don't I don't want to know those answers. I just want to be in peace. <laughs> And, yeah. and it kind of goes back to like my earlier point of like so much of this responsibility is put on the consumers. And so if this responsibility is put on the consumers, there's a certain level of exhaustion that comes into play where sometimes you want to be really, really a morally a good person. And sometimes you need a dress in two days. Uh, it's it's yeah. going to happen. Some days your morals are going to be a little bit compromised. And I don't think that, you know, consumers should uh, have the bear that responsibility, you know, all of the time where, like I said earlier, there's the overwhelming, the top 100 companies have contributed to more than 70% of emissions since the 1980s. And so yeah. that's where the blame should be. That's where the change should be. But that YouTube video talked about how, you know, how, where did fast fashion, you know, sort of where, where was it born? And when did the concepts of like fashion begin? And, you know, how did they start, you know, uh, replicating outfits? Because before fashion very much was like you, uh, one artist made clothing for one person and it was somebody who was very well to do, royals, um, you know, that, that sort of market. And it wasn't until the early 1900s that these machines started being industrialized and that's when fast fashion started. So it was like English country countrysides, apparently what happened is and all these farmers were kicked out of their lands in like the, the British UK area. They were kicked off their land. And when they were kicked off their land, they were forced to move into these bigger cities. Well, the bigger cities had all of the factories in it. And so that's where yeah. the concept of fast fashion was born. And then when it became like, you know, politically not good to have those uh, fast fashion factories in the UK area, then they started searching for other areas. So they started um, searching for other areas of the world to outsource that part of the production. And that's how, you know, fast fashion was born. So it's, it, I thought it was super interesting that, you know, a lot of those same issues that were developed in one country were just, they knew of them, they knew of these issues, and they still chose to outsource to other countries. And so, that's where like the onus of, you know, greenwashing comes into play, which is starting to become, you know, more apparent, you know, they, a lot of food brands will use the phrase like organic, there's no sort of government regulating body that can determine if something is truly organic or not. It's kind of a marketing ploy. So now we're starting to see this with retailers who are saying like, oh, you know, sustainably sourced, but then you do a little bit of digging and uh, they're not so sustainably mm -hmm. sourced. So one app that I did find that can help you if you are looking um, to maybe start slowly changing your habits, your purchasing habits of getting away from, you know, I need the dress in two days to, these other brands and and one uh, one site that you can look this up is called good for you and so they will basically go to a brand's website they have a certain amount of criteria on where the sources come from um what the the labor you know the what the workers environment labor environment looks like um and then you know return shipping and how long the guard you know what kind of materials are in the stuff that you make um polyester i i uh, heard is one of the worst, I guess, offenders because they have so much min like uh, the what is it, the microplastics in their yeah. materials, so that yep. when you wear them, they don't last very long. Yep. And to your point earlier, we're buying so much more clothing now, but that clothing isn't lasting as long. It's being sent to a landfill where it's something like a dump truck of clothes are burned every second of the day globally. So we're consuming so much more and polyester materials are, are a big part of that. And they're getting found in like these deep sea ocean animals where like 70% of the animals in like the, the deep sea have microplastics inside of them. And they think that that's how is because of these clothings 
that are made of plastic end up in our water systems and you know it's just a whole chain of events really crazy it's uh I think I think I had a couple of facts up here too when I did something in fast fashion. Uh, yeah, sixty percent of most of it's made from the plastic-based materials, like you said, and then the text the textile dyeing, actually twenty percent of global wa hmm. waste uh, water comes from just the dyeing process itself. So, oh wow, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, not good for the environment, uh, but it's it's tough because, like you said, like. Uh, the average person buys at least 14 items of new clothes every single year. So from what she in. Yeah. So at one point, are we? <laughs> yeah. Where do you, where do down. you, and, and from that same video, it was, they also said the average person buys a new piece of clothing every five days. So if you're buying those pieces yeah. of clothing and they're only lasting, you know, maybe two, three times that you're going to wear them, that's where, these other companies that are coming like the the good for you site where they'll go and they'll analyze all of those things of like what the brand is saying sustainability wise if it's just kind of bullshit or if they're you know actually a good company so they have a ranking of like five different you know like uh, avoid or we support um one of the companies that i thought was really cool that probably deserves a little bit of a deep dive maybe you know an idea for a future point of sale episode is sheep inc they, mm. they make um, wool. So wool is like apparently like the superstar as far as like sustainable fabrics. Cotton is next, but you know, the recyclability of it is yeah. a little bit questionable, but wool apparently is, is like the upper echelon of, of quality fabrics um, that can be reused and reworn for years. And it had, you know, less of an environmental impact, all that good stuff. Um, but this company Sheep Inc, and every purchase you make, they will send you a button with your wool clothing so you can see the entire supply chain of that product and the impacts that of each part of that supply chain so like and you could also see the sheep that your piece of clothing came from oh they're not dead so yeah <laughs> At first, I was right. like, wait. So it's, they're still alive. Yeah, yeah they're still so alive. That's part of the sustainability. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, oh, wait. <laughs> yes. No, that's good. Good. <laughs> um, but it looked it looked really cool. My first thought, though, because I, it, that's always like, I guess, where my first thought, though, goes is, OK, these buttons that you're sending, how sustainable are the buttons? Um, so that was sort of like my first point. I was like, hmm. How sustainable are we if we're sending, you know, an electronic device um, and that was probably made from plastic? Um, I don't know what the actual button looks like, um, but I have <laughs> seen the button in action and the content that they give you, which I think is really um, interesting because you can see the entire supply chain, including the sheep that your your clothing came from. That's interesting. Uh, that would be cool to like have. Mm -hmm. But then again, you're also thinking, like, as a buyer, and I'm buying something every five days. At some point, I'm like, who cares? I did. Th well, the also the the button, like the the novelty of it, would be so cool for like five seconds. Exactly. And then like, what do you do I, with the button? By storing these buttons somewhere, <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> I feel like they could probably just maybe send you a link. We're basically the... <laughs> tearing this up Shark Tank style right now. We're like, hmm. Well, that's actually a perfect segment. <laughs> or a perfect transition to go into our next segment, which uh, we wanted to talk about. The, or, or wait, I guess I should probably ask it. Any last thoughts on, on sort of fast fashion and what uh, folks can do or not do? Or uh, I would say I think there's uh, there's other things to consider, too, when you look at the fast fashion uh, behemoths out there. IP is one of them. You brought this up, right? Like it could, a lot of a lot of celebrities and a lot of people have sued these companies for stealing their ideas in uh, different oh, uh, styles and stuff like that. So always consider that, right? Like, uh, it, are you also hurting the person that came up with this idea? Imagine you came up with this yourself. It, are you happy that China is just pushing these things out at no cost to you really, or them? Um, that's another thing I have with it, but it's also, I think just being, uh, being a uh, reasonable as a consumer, if you don't like it and you're going to stand up and to the point where you're going to shame someone on Instagram about it, you better not order anything off that site again. Right. right. Like just, 
uh, talk the talk, walk the walk type of situation, I think is, is big here. I don't think they're going away anytime soon. I think that they could easily make themselves adhere to SEC rulings if there are any, but that's the thing. I don't think we'll see any. So it's kind of like a kick rock situation, especially it really depends, right? We have an election coming up where that could go to. Yeah, pretty well said. So um, I guess to be continued, especially yes. in, in that world. But I'll, I'll leave a couple of those helpful links in the show notes. Should you want to, you know, sort of take your, I guess, morality to the next level and, and start yeah. searching for, you know, these companies that are, are trying to do good and they deserve to be supported because that that's a really good point you brought up about, you know, some of these smaller designers and creators who are coming up with these different outfit ideas and then they're getting counterfeited, essentially, yeah. which we yeah. all know the counterfeit market in China is ridiculous. Yes. Um, there's hardly any kind of laws to protect the Etsy sale sellers have been going through this, um, you know, even, you know, some of the, the shoppers on, on Amazon on who sell custom items that is what, what happens which is super interesting is that a lot of these companies will rip off the original design of like yeah. american companies and then they'll get all of these other shops or all of these other fake accounts to try to review bomb or to try yeah. to you know get takedown notices for the original creator of it so yeah. there's a lot of like kind of like, uh, I guess, retail warfare that's going on. Um, yeah. In addition to, you know, the, the ethical nature of the, the, the where you're buying the products. So there's a whole lot of strings to pull on that discussion, but um, felt like uh, we, we needed to defend the logistics girlies out here um, from getting oh infiltrated. You know me, guys, I'm <laughs> about logistics. Like, well, yeah. What's funny is that she said logistic. She didn't say yeah. logistics. Yeah. <laughs> dead I, dead I, ringer. You know me, guys, I'm about logistic. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs>